your skin, that shit is popping, girl. Body on ten, damn, you got it, girl. You got a boss up, getting them checks, living your best, racks up. Session every weekend with Sunday School with Lex. Connect with like-minded black women every Sunday at 6 on the Lexus Exodus platform where we have live panels and call-in shows in order to connect and share our stories, discuss divestment and other important topics pertaining to the plights of black women, discuss self-empowerment and self-improvement, and much, much more. Tune in every Sunday at 6 p.m. ET at patreon.com slash Lexus Exodus. See you soon. Hey, boos, hey. It is Lexus Exodus, leader of the Black Women Exodus. How are y'all doing? And like always, if you enjoy this content, please like and subscribe. Please share. Please comment in the comment section. Let me know that you're listening. Also, if you enjoy listening to my content on the go, the show is now available on Spotify and Apple Podcasts for audio listeners. Go check out my Patreon community where you can get access to bonus episodes and exclusive content and also a private community of like-minded, divested women. It is linked below. Please also follow me on social media platforms. You can check me out everywhere on all platforms at Lexis Exodus. I also have a backup channel just in case something happens to this one. It is called Lex X. That's L-E-X-E-X. You can find all of this information in the description below. This is another installment of my series called The Blackistan Zoo, where we profile the dusty derelicts, crazy creatures, and animals in Blackistan. So we back, (laughs) y'all. We back because a few weeks back, we started having a conversation about retro dust. In the spirit of Black History Month, we started talking about back in the day dust, throwback dusties. So let's keep it going, like I promised. And tonight we are back with part two, talking about how people in the community love to be nostalgic and romanticize whack males from back in the day and like to pretend many of these dudes were honorable and courageous leaders who made many strides in the community. When in reality, the overwhelming majority of these dudes were treasonous, they were dishonest, they had no loyalty, no integrity, they hated being Black. They hated their Black wives and children as well. They oftentimes abandoned them. They were simply historical dusties. So we're going to continue the conversation about historical dust. And shout out to my good sis Campari. I love her, loyal subby, loyal patron. She is brilliant. She is absolutely smart. She sent me so much content on this topic to make this show easier. Y'all don't know how much y'all mean to me when y'all look out for me like this. She sent timestamps. She sent articles, all sorts of stuff. A special shout out to my good sis Campari, who contributed a buttload of items for this video and made this show possible. Thank you, boo. (laughs) So let's get to it. Last time we talked about this topic, we talked about although people love to condemn modern dusties for their music choices and how they love to glamorize the culture and how they celebrate the degradation and disrespect of Black women. Well, y'all, this is nothing new. There's nothing new under the sun because they also did this back in the day as well. So let's first look at another song that illustrates this. And by the way, if you missed part one, I will pin that below where I initially started talking about this bullcrap. And shout out to my good sis, Brooke, who shared this. Oh, my God. 
tell when I'm black or I'm Y'all hear this mess. What type of slave shucking and jiving tomfoolery? What mess is this? And just to preface this, I know y'all was saying last time the song that I played sounded like demonic chipmunks. Y'all was cracking up because it did sound like a bunch of imps or something. But I have to speed these songs up to avoid any copyright dings from YouTube. So that's why it sounds like that. But just in case you're having trouble deciphering what the dude is saying here, he's saying a jet black woman is the meanest woman on this earth. I have a woman so black, you can't tell when I black her eye. The only way I can tell when I hurt her is when she hangs her head and cry. She's a nappy headed woman, ugly as she can be. Okay, I I'm gonna just pause just to let that breathe. Child, and this was from 1958, y'all. So from 60 years ago, guys. So the community will love to talk about today's generations corrupting the music industry, saying that they're negatively impacting the youth with problematic and toxic music. No, they've been singing and rapping about how they hate you, dark butts. They've been doing this since the 1950s. This is how trash they are. I've never seen or heard anything so blatantly ridiculous like, this is absolutely ridiculous how brazen and how he, he didn't mince words here. He said, you not be head of ugly black woman. I like you because I can black your eye and no one can tell. Child, no wonder Lil Wayne feels comfortable saying beautiful black woman. I bet she looks better at. No wonder Chris Brown feels comfortable walking around today talking about I only F the bees with good hair. No wonder non-black women like Danny Lay feel comfortable talking about yellow bone is what he want. Do you understand what I'm saying? Like, look where they learned it from. This is not new behavior. They learned it from the degenerates of the past. They're just historical dust. They've been colorist. They've been texturist. They've been misogynoirist and spewing hatred towards black women since birth. So I want to keep going and I want to talk about this next historical dusty music artist who wanted to ingratiate within white culture so bad he legally changed his name to N-Word Boy to become successful in the country music industry, y'all. Child, and this video is from Tease Messy History. She has a whole channel devoted to exposing this mess. I have to credit her. Check her out if you feel like going down a rabbit hole of the historical dusties. But y'all gotta watch this because this is a hot mess. Today's story comes from this issue of Jet Magazine, dated March 1st, 1979. The article is titled Boys, His Name country music's his game. And it reads, He calls himself the only registered leader in the country, and for good reason. In 1976, Lee M. Coleman petitioned the Montgomery County Court to have his name legally changed to Boy. Judge Walker Hobby Jr.'s order of April 17, 1978, made it official, and Dear Boy hasn't winced once. In fact, he's angling toward making a fortune on the name. Born in Fonsdale, Alabama, N.B. moved to Los Angeles a few weeks ago to pursue his country and western singing career and his comedy impressionist act. He legally changed his name after he kept getting turned down for singing jobs in white Alabama clubs. Quote, I'd be told, oh, you can't sing so much that I decided to tell some of the club owners that my name was nigger boy. They got a kick out of it, so I decided to change my name legally. <laughs> what is this mess? What is this mess? I don't even know what to do but to laugh. 
at the ridiculousness of these Dusty's conduct and their behavior. This don't make no sense. And I'm sorry, this tickled me so much. So first off, let me shout out this brilliant Black woman again who devoted her entire channel to exposing historical dust. Again, it's called T's Hot Mess History. I'll link it below. Please check her out. So this Dusty wanted to be a country singer back in the day. So he wanted it so bad, he legally changed his name to N-Word Boy so he could shuck and jive for the white man. Law, you can't make this mess up. The jokes write themselves. I don't even know what to say about this. People ask me all the time if I think I'll ever run out of content. Hell no. Hell no. The Dusties do this every day. They make this job too easy to expose them. But anyway, this damn dummy legally changed his name to the N-word just to be validated by the white community. So like we always say, instead of building his own platforms, instead of seeking success in his own community, the damn Dusty conformed because they are white worshiping. They seek validation so much so that he changed his name to the N-word, y'all. Okay, so I wanna keep going because the last time we talked about this topic, we talked about MLK's degeneracy and his obsession with white women and how he mistreated his wife so much and cheated on her left and right for mediocre Becky's and Barnyard Karen's. Well, Malcolm X did this as well. White man has, uh... Uh, 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 in, uh, has uh, bred on our people, brainwashed the so-called Negro to the point of uh, believing in white supremacy so much that today some Negroes think that they're not making progress or they don't have anything unless they're living in a white neighborhood, unless they have the white man's neighborhood, mm -hmm. uh, a, a seat in the white man's school or a, a position on the white man's job, and they even have taken it so far they don't think they're successful unless, in, in life unless they have a white w woman as a wife. But our crime wasn't burglary. It was sleeping with white girls. They threw the book at us. And count 14. 14 eight counts of 8 years. to 10 years. A lot about Malcolm X. Um, I read his autobiography. And um, one of the chapters, uh, he talks about how when he was a teen, he used to go to these like dances that they had back then. And, you know, they were mostly, you know, mostly black people went to them. But one day this white girl shows up. And... Um, that she was the best looking white girl he's ever seen. You know, this the best looking blonde. So like, in my mind, cause Malcolm X is a good looking dude. In my mind, I'm thinking like Pamela Anderson level, right? I'm like, oh, she has to be pretty. I gotta look this woman up. You know what? It was the forties, I think. So I don't know what I was expecting. Um, this is, this was what he looked like at the time. Um, yeah, things were definitely different back then. Um, Child, I cannot. I cannot. <laughs> so we see Malcolm X talking that pro-black-ish, that militant race loyalty bullcrap they try to stuff down black women's throats to force us to display this unrequited loyalty to people who don't do the same. Meanwhile, he had a documented, open, very vocal obsession with being with white women. So much so to the point that he went to prison for years over messing with them. And basic, I might add, just like MLK. And several of y'all pointed out in that last video, that picture of the woman that he used to be so in love with, that he continued to cheat on his wife with women who looked like her. Y'all told me that she was not the correct woman photo. No, this is actually the Betty Maltz that MLK was obsessed with, very average. And not only was she uneducated, like we talked about, and undignified, she was also very unattractive, okay? So even in this clip about Malcolm X, Becky like, what the hell? So she attributes it to it just being the 40s and maybe the beauty standards were different. No, the fact is, is Nogs have always been attracted to mediocre looking white women. And we see them dating barnyard Beckys till this day. They've always been historically dusty while in the same breath indoctrinating and brainwashing you to guilt you to be race loyal. Child, so I want to keep going and I want to talk about the Black Panther Party. A lot of you guys requested that I highlight this and expose the degeneracy within the Black Panther Party. 
And I want to talk about how although the Dusties are credited for being the leaders of this party, it was actually Black women who did the legwork and who were in the street supporting the community single-handedly. Okay, and Kapari writes, Hi Lex, one point that's good to mention about the Black Panther Party is the vast majority of members, upwards of 70%, were Black women. So while it's portrayed as a manly movement of men, it was more like the traditional pimping dynamic that we see over and over again in the Black community. The men insisted on leading by which they meant taking credit for the work of Black women. And she says, I'll try to send you some sources. And she sends this article where it talks about these wonderful women within the party. So Dolores Henderson, Joyce Lee, Mary Ann Carlton, Joyce Means, and Paula Hill. I don't recollect hearing any of those names, but these are the movers and the shakers and the true leaders of the party. And yeah, this article even says they're not names that are widely recollected in the retelling of the Black Panther Party. They represent a segment of the party who often work 17, 18, 19 hour days to actualize this vision. So I want to look at a few clips that illustrate who the true leaders of the Black Panther Party were and the things that they did. Good morning, TikTokers. So I was looking in the Washington Post and came across this article, Historically Illuminating Photos of Women Black Panthers. The Black Panther Party, one of the most influential responses of racism and inequality in American history, advocated armed self-defense to counter police brutality and initiated a program of patrolling the police with guns and law books. Residents attend the Community Survival Conference where the Black Panthers conducted testing for sickle cell anemia on March 31, 1972. Women were instrumental in the Black Panther Party, including its work to set up and run an after-school program in Harlem in 1971. Black Panther member Erica Huggins laughs with comrades after the Black Community Survival Conference in March 1972. She served the Los Angeles, New York, and Oakland offices of the party. This is Gloria Abernathy, who was active in the Black Panther Party, sells the Black Panther newspaper at the Mayfair Supermarket Boycott in Oakland in 1971. Tamara Lacey holds a sickle cell anemia poster. Wow. The two women with bags of food at the People's Free Food Program, one of the Panthers' survival programs, and a free Huey rally is held in Provo Park. The official name of the park is Constitution Park, but it became Provo Park in honor of Dutch Provost. It was named Martin Luther King Jr. Civic Park, Civic Center Park in 1983. And this one, Black Panther children in a classroom with their teacher, Yvonne Carter, widow of Al Prentice Bungie Carter at the Intercommunal, Intercommunal Youth Institute, the Black Panther School. Now, of course, I just did the italics underneath of each photo, but this is an amazing article. It's in the Washington Post, Black History Month. Did y'all know that the WIC program, globally known as a government assistance program created by the government, was originally started by the Black Panther Party? A lot of people are calling themselves fact-checking this, saying that this is false, but we're going to get down to the truth today. In 1969, the Black Panthers created a program called Free Breakfast for School Children that was responsible for feeding thousands and thousands of children before school. 
Not only did they feed children free breakfast before school, but they also had programs that fed poor and oppressed people in their communities as well. The Black Panthers were committed to protecting and providing for our people. They had free schools, free health clinics, free legal clinics. They even had programs geared to protecting the seniors in the community. They was really about that life. Do y'all see this? I had no idea. I knew some of these pieces of information, but Blackistan doesn't teach you the true historical context of what happened back in the day. I didn't know any of these ladies. OK, so when you think of the Black Panther Party, I don't know, I think of militant dusties and black leather hats. But the true reality is that the women protected and led this party and protected the community. The women developed testing centers for sickle cell anemia, a disease that we know disproportionately affects black people. That's amazing. Black Panther women started after school programs for the children. They started WIC, y'all. And WIC is something that sustains millions of women today of all colors, y'all. I know I benefited from it when I was 23 and, and poor and didn't have no business having children. So this is amazing. And we know that this continues still to this day. Just like the Black women do now, the Black women did all the work back in the day. They sustained the community single-handedly. They supported everything. They were the pillars of the community, even though they don't get credit for anything. Okay? So while the women were sustaining and working and muling to single-handedly protect and heal and, and clothe and feed the people within the hood, here's what the Black Panther niggas was out doing. And again, shout out to Campari, who shared a lot of this, and also Indigo Savage, who shared these clips with me. And trigger warning, these contain some tough references. Y'all, so let's watch this, and then we will talk through. Uh, Elders Cleaver is a admitted. And in the first essay, he's talking about how he has this, he's dealing with this, love for white women that he just can't shake right and he's asking the other men in the prison do they what kind of women they like so everybody said all the black men in there are saying oh i like white women I like japanese women i like mexican women then he was like and then he was like well what about black women and they was like i don't want nothing black but a cadillac like they just like they don't want a black woman so he's like what is going on? Like, why do we have this hate against black women? You know, as the year goes on in 1955, you know, Emmett Till was in 1955 for flirting for whistling at a white woman. But back then, he was at the time, the information was that Emmett Till flirted with a white woman. And so he like sees the white woman and he's like, I'm attracted to this white woman that got Emmett Till killed. Like, I'm attracted to her. And he's, like, really pissed at himself. He's, like, mad at himself. Like, why do I like, why, why am I, in, why do I like this woman? Why, why do I get turned on or why am I attracted to this woman? Like, she literally got Emmett Till killed and I'm still attracted to her. Y'all, so we two videos in, y'all already but her, okay? But. It doesn't change what the books are saying, okay? Now, these are cons these are books that are considered classics. When I say Malcolm X autobiography says this stuff, uh, Asada says the same thing, who was actually a respected minister in the Black Panthers. And he had already done these crimes. He would never have been a, a, a leader in the Black community today once we found out he was and an admitted. He talks about it as if that it was something he did in his past and <clears throat> that, you know, that's something he learned was wrong to do. But you black women and white women and you've already done the deed. You already hurt these people and you don't feel no remorse for real. It doesn't feel like it from the way he's writing about it. It's not like he's remorseful for it. He just realized he just come to the conclusion that it was wrong somewhere along the way. But the most disrespectful thing for him to say is he 
wanted to stick it to the white man for making him feel this way about white women. He wanted to stick it to the white man for making him feel like they imposed this white beauty standard on him. This is, you know, the way they made him feel like the white woman was over black women. He had to stick it to the white man for making him feel like that, right? So the way you're going to stick it to the white man is to white women. But before you before you white women, you're going to practice on black women in the black ghetto. And then he falls in love with his white lawyer and he writes all these love letters to her, which um, she she had to sue him because he, she didn't he didn't give her any money for putting her in his book. But that's that's a whole nother video. I could I want to make a whole nother video on about about um how these black inmates fall in love with their white lawyers and they actually the lawyers actually fall in love with them and they actually start a relationship and I can read about that when we talk when if I talk about uh this book I got on the Attica Uprising in 1971 that happened in New York. So that's a whole nother video. We got a lot to talk about. Y'all, I just hate that I have to endure this and expose y'all to this. Like, like really, y'all, I am so intentional about the things that I allow in my space. And I'm so protective about my energy. So people will like y'all to think that divestors are miserable and bitter. I start off every day with affirmations and meditations and lighting incense and make sure that I'm centered. I journal every morning. I work out. I hydrate myself. I really do a lot of reflecting, a lot of visualization exercises, all of that. So y'all, when I tell y'all this crap be so difficult for me to cover after being so intentional about making my space healthy and a safe space, y'all, I'm sorry to subject y'all to this as well. This sucks. But I do feel convicted and I feel that it's imperative that we start to talk about this and to spread awareness about this. Because this is what we are brainwashed and uh, are stuffed down our throats with, um, you know, exalting these so-called male leaders. This is what they were doing in the Black Panther Party, y'all. While the women were doing the real work, Eldridge Cleaver and other so-called leaders were out running amok, wreaking havoc and doing mess like this. Like, why are we exalting and honoring and memorializing Eldridge Cleaver and others like him, crediting him for the work that the women did in this party? When this dude openly said in this book, that he wrote, that he went to prison, y'all, and talked to other prisoners in prison <laughs> who, who talked about their preferences. They said they had preferences, and they all demeaned and talked badly about Black women. Y'all, the damn prisoners in prison who are in solitary confinement on cell block six, they talking about their damn preferences, y'all. And to make matters worse, this Black Panther leader was admittedly and openly an R-worder and he talked about in this book how he victimized black women and girls for practice for white women, y'all. He did that heinous ish to get back at the man. That's the, this is how they try to justify the degeneracy, y'all. When it, it's obvious he was just an actual deviant, y'all. And to make matters worse, he even went on to create this crude and lewd, nasty, perverted fashion line that consisted of pants that showcase dudes' genitals, y'all. And I'm trying not to be explicit. Y'all know I got to keep this PG because it's YouTube. But my audio listeners, I'm going to put some pictures here. I encourage y'all to go back and look at this because words cannot describe how nasty and how disgusting and ridiculous this is. <laughs> ridiculous, no pun intended, y'all. <laughs> uh, but this is y'all's revolutionaries, guys. This is y'all's thought leaders. This is y'all's kings. Is this your king? This is your king. This is what we're taught from birth to honor and to exalt and to remember, especially around Black History Month every year. And it boggles my mind because Black Ascent understands very clearly how it's problematic to have statues of things like Confederate soldiers or for people to use Confederate flags and how we can't memorialize non-Black people with trash history. But when it comes to people like this, Black people suddenly get amnesia. 
They suddenly become history revisionists. Seriously, like they have selective memory and pick and choose with what historical figures they are outraged by and who they consider problematic. Y'all know every Christopher Columbus day, just a few months ago, oh, he's trash. You know, social media posts talking about the only Christopher we acknowledge is Wallace. But then it's like when it comes to Kwanzaa and the Black Males and the Black Panther Party who founded it being equally as trash as those dudes terrorizing innocent women, hurting and harming innocent people, wreaking havoc everywhere. All of a sudden it's mums of work. Nobody got nothing to say. Don't nobody want to talk about it. Everybody is silent. And this woman who shared these clips is so taken aback by this dude's antics and even goes on to say, well, if he if he was alive today, if he was a leader today, that the Black community would cancel him. He would be canceled. And that's not true. Like I said, this community has selective outrage. Come here, R. Kelly. Come here, Pill Cosby. Come here. Um, what's the other dude, the leper convict? Um, what's that dude's name? I don't know why I'm having a brain fart. Y'all know who I'm talking about, the one who hurt Meg. Y'all, people, black women alike, will still support and defend these men loyally. And it's like successful, accomplished black dudes in the community are so rare. It don't matter how trash the nog is, black people will still continue to support them and exalt them and will ignore how problematic they are. Happy Black History Month. I hope y'all enjoyed it, y'all. This, that trash-ish we supposed to be celebrating every year. Dust season their degeneracy. Thank God that ish is over with. And I almost didn't do this because I was so busy, but I felt very compelled to come here to do this part two, especially after several of y'all wrote into me and indicated that you guys watched with your children to teach them the truth so they weren't brainwashed like we were. Y'all, I appreciate it. I appreciate y'all listening. I know this was hard. So thank you so much for always supporting and hanging in there with me. All right, y'all. Until next time, see you guys. Bye. a red iPhone. If you please bring it to the sound stage. Red iPhone, appreciate it. Thank you.